Enough. That was Miss Piggy I was quoting there. All right, let me see here. We are going to do electrical, automotive electronic test 13. Test 13. I'm going to shut this off. And we're talking about gauges. Now, let me, let me do a little bit of preliminary on gauges and stuff. Um, the very first gauge that I know about anybody putting on a car to speak of was the Boyce Motometer. And what they did was they had this glass hood ornament thing that was stuck in the radiator. And through the windshield, you could look out there and see it. And it was like a thermometer, you know, that would give an indicator of how hot the engine was. Right. And then they started putting the little needles on the dash, right? You got speedometer, you got oil pressure, you got whether it's charging or not. You know, for years they put an amp meter on the dash instead of a voltmeter. And then in the late 70s, they decided they were going to put voltmeters on there. And that confused the crud out of everybody because everybody was used to, if it was charging, it would be over on the right side. But only, it's only going to show a charge if it needs a charge. So a lot of times it'd be in the middle, right? And so they had to retool those volt gate voltmeters so they would be in the middle. Is that my... Was there a credit? Yeah. She said she couldn't find one anywhere. Okay. So, uh... You want me to drop it off with her, or...? Well, she's in Andalusia. Oh. I'll, it don't go back to the other little lady? Nah, it goes over there to the... Oh, okay. goes over to the other campus and all that. Oh, okay. Uh, that's a credit. Now, wait a minute. This is a... Is this a credit? Mm-hmm. Okay, it doesn't look like a credit because it says reprint, or it doesn't say well, credit. Well, we had to do a reprint. I know, but it doesn't say credit in the middle of the, you know. Mm -hmm. But on the screen, it's in red. But you know what? That looks that, like... That, that like, might have not... It was in red, but usually if you credit it, it will take the regular invoice and turn it red, too. That don't look like a credit, it looks like an invoice. Mm -hmm, it does to me too. I, right. I hate to do this to you, but well, fix that for me. I will. She said but it, hang it, on it, to it's, that she said it's not that. it's not showing up on a statement. That's okay. what she was gonna play. Okay. okay. Now that I look at it, I see. All right. But anyway, uh, so now think about this. You're the engineer, you've got to come up with a gauge that will work. Right? What about it, Brian? You gotta come up with a gauge that'll work. Yeah, I, got a, I need a little needle, I need a little needle on the dash, and I need it to move. And initially, the way they did that, you know what bimetal is? You know what a bimetal strip is? You don't know what a bimetal strip is? This right here, see this little thing right here? That's a bimetal strip on the end of that fan clutch. Now, a lot of them have got a spiral spring. This one here is just like that. If you heat that bimetal strip up, it's going to change shape. But if you cool it off, it goes back to its original shape. It's two pieces of metal married together, and one of them expands faster than the other, so when you heat it up, it does that. You know the old turn signal flashers, the little round can with the two prongs on it? You've seen them. They go ding, 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 ding. Have you seen those? They make a little, they got a little bimetal strip in them, and as the currents flow into those bulbs, it's going through the little bimetal strip, it changes, and then it cools off and it goes back. So it actually is just going back and forth. It heats up, it cools off, heats up, cools off, and it's just going to really fast. Well, these gauges used to have bimetal strips in them that were hooked to the needle. And they'd have a little wire wrapped around that bimetal strip so it would heat up when the gauge provided more ground to the sensor and all that. Now, there was a voltage regulator, instrument voltage regulator in there so that they didn't get too hot and all that. One time I was working on an 83 Jeep, and I pulled the instrument cluster out, which I, I do this all the time, you know, I pull the instrument cluster out. But one of the screws that was holding the instrument cluster in on the 83 J-Series Jeep was providing ground for the instrument cluster. And when I pulled it loose and I switched it on, I didn't react fast enough, but every gauge in that dash went all the way to hot, or all the way to the high range, and, and, and then they went all the way back down, they never moved again. Because the instrument cluster voltage regulator ground was through one of the screws that was mounting the cluster. And that's not the way it is on hardly anything else. I've never seen it on any other car. But I, I just burnt that one slam up. Anyway, I was gonna draw that, but it's easier to describe it that way. That's a bimetal strip, and that's how they do that. So. Electromagnetic gauges have got windings in them that are laid in there at 90 degrees, right? They got three wires hooked to them. And basically, they got power, they got ground, they got one coming from the center. The more of a ground that comes from a center, the more that magnetic field alters so that it pulls that gauge over to that. So if I've got a gas gauge on my you know, vehicle, on, this is 
basic rule of thumb for a long time on plain old electromagnetic gauges. You unplug the gas gauge, where does the gas, in other words, you unplug the sending unit in the tank, where does the gas gauge go? Or if somebody cuts the wire, or if your dog gets under there and chews it, where does it go? It goes all the way to full. If I short that wire that's coming from the gauge to the, from the sending unit to the gauge, if I short it to ground, it goes all the way to empty. Now, if you short a temperature gauge, it goes all the way to full. If you short an oil temperature gauge, it goes all the way to high oil pressure. So you gotta kinda know how these things work. They're not that complicated. Now on the newer model cars, the instrument cluster is a computer. And it actually is a lot of times getting information off the network to tell it what to do with the gauges. Remember, hear me in electronics talking about this uh, high beam indicator on this Grand Cherokee I was working on that was flashing a binary code. And on that, uh, uh, that thing, whenever you would uh, operate the high and low beams, it actually would send a request to the body controller. And the body controller would operate relays that would change the lights. And then it would send a request back to the instrument cluster and say, would you please give me a high beam indicator? Years ago, they just had it tied in, you know, had a little light behind a little blue, uh, we'd say bright, or it'd have a picture of a light bulb, and it would turn on blue. That means you're on your high beams and all that. Anyway, so let's dive into this. Electromagnetic, electromagnetic gauges use heat to produce needle movement. That is, flies in the face of what I just told you, doesn't it? They don't use heat. What do they use? If they're electromagnetic, what do they use? I need feedback, y'all. Electricity? Well, sort of. What are they, if it's electromagnetic, what does it use, Brian? Electromagnetic. Magnetism. That's right. It uses magnetism. Uh, so that one's going to be a false. It's normal for some electromagnetic gauges to remain at their last position when the ignition is turned off. Now, before with the bimetal gauges, when the instrument voltage regulator shut down, they would always cool off and go back to the you know, the bottom. On the computerized gauges that we see, like how many, how many of you have ever driven a car, and yours may even do this, when you crank it up, and you probably see that on that Kia, when you crank it up, the gauges do a full sweep and then go back. You ever see them do that? When you fire it up, you see them go, ooh, ding, they go all the way back. If, if, if it's got a, in, a microprocessor in the dash that's driving those needles, a lot of the times it'll do that, it'll sweep them. And you can actually talk to that with your scan, scan tool on some of them and tell it to sweep all the gauges. If you're talking, if you've got an instrument cluster that's got a microprocessor in it that you can talk to your scan tool, you can check your gauges that way. You can check your warning indicators. You can do your chimes and all that stuff. You've got to be in that cluster and all. Uh, and some of them have the ability to talk and some don't. But anyway, number two is true because sometimes when you switch off the electro, a car with an electromagnetic gauge, you may say the fuel gauge stay where it was when you switched it off. Uh, the speedometer excuse me, displays the speed based on an electrical signal from an output speed sensor. That's true too. You're basically, like I've got an instrument, I mean a speedometer up there that I usually, you know, hold up and talk about. And uh, the old kind of speedometers were this kind, and the kind of newer kind are this kind. Now this one here, this speedometer here has got a a little drum in there. And as I spin that thing, the needle hook to that, see that? See that thing moving as I spin my screwdriver? And what I'm doing is I'm spinning this place where the needle goes. And there's a little drum here. And there's a little, this little copper drum in there has got a little post on it that's hooked to that uh, needle. And there's a little spiral spring that's holding it down here on its, you know, bottom place. And as you spin this, there's a magnet in that drum is trying to get it to, that's trying to follow that. I used to take these apart and repair them sometimes and uh, kind of enjoyed that. And whenever we put a replacement speedometer on one, sometimes we would take the drum out of the old speedometer and put it in there so the miles wouldn't change because it's a breach of federal law to put a car out with fewer miles on it than what it had when it came in. Did you know that? If you happen to put an instrument cluster in that comes from a junkyard and it says 50,000 miles and the one you pulled out says 112,000 miles, that's a breach of federal law. You're not supposed to do that, right? Now, a lot of you know, time shops just don't pay any attention to that. They do whatever they got to, and they put a sticker on the door. Speedometer was replaced at whatever miles. The replacement speedometers, a lot of times, would have a red tenth digit on them. And so we would, uh, we would pull this drum out, and we'd drop it in there. When you got a red tenth digit on one of the older cars, it would knock 25% off your trade-in value right off the top because they didn't know how many miles was actually on it. I got a funny story about that, but I'm not going to tell it right now. Now, this one here, you might notice... On the back, you don't have a place for a speedometer cable. Right? It's got power and ground, and I can actually create a signal 
with that one scan tool we got out there that will drive this needle, right? You see that I can fool with that needle right there? That's uh, right over Crown Victoria. And so basically it's a totally electronic speedometer. It's got this little motor in here that spins and operates that little wheel. Now, let me ask you this. What if I came to you and I told you that my odometer was working but my speedometer wasn't? Or if my speedometer was working but my odometer wasn't? What do I know? This is junk. Get rid of it, put another one in there. Now when you go to the uh, dealership, you're going to have to give them the miles and sign papers and all that kind of stuff because they're not going to, you know, they know me over there and they know who I am and so when I had to have a speedometer for my pickup like it was killing the battery a while back, uh, they made me fill out some papers and tell them how many miles it was on it and all that kind of stuff. And they got me a speedometer and they got it programmed with the right number of miles. But the simple fact was, you know that that's bad. Now, one time there was this lady that came to me and she had this Ford Tempo. And she says, it was a brand new car. And she said, my car seems to be making a, a lot of noise when I'm at road speed and all. And she said, I just really don't know what to do about it. I said, well, let me see what she's talking about. So I headed off up 231. And yeah, it was sort of like a lot of wind noise and a lot of turbulence. And it just felt strange. And, you know, I was, speedometer said I was going about 60 miles an hour. But then I started noticing that I was blowing past cars like a dog on a doormat. Okay, so now my speedometer is not accurate. <laughs> What am I going to do to determine the accuracy of the speedometer? Isn't it talking about the distance of the car, the car in front of you or something like that? Sort of, but because watch this. Here's a couple, there's a lot of ways you can do it. You can open the GPS up on your phone and it'll help. But it's not always exactly accurate. Two GPS units. I've had two GPS units in the same car and they'll read two different speeds. You know what I mean? So that's not always accurate. But what is accurate is a watch. I take my watch. I'm, I'm past, I'm, I set that thing on 60 miles an hour and I make sure there's not any cars in front of me or anything so I can hang on 60, right? I'm going to pass this mile marker and I'm going to be looking at my watch. 60 seconds later, if I'm going 60 miles an hour, I should be passing that next mile marker, right? You can do it with a watch like this one right here. The only reason I know about the whole car thing is because my dad's 864, mm -hmm. but I don't know what in it. Yeah. So I had, I had never knew how he managed not to get a ticket. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're just, if you, if you know, you can kind of, he's had enough experience driving to where he kind of knows when he's driving too fast. That's what it amounts to. But see, your job is to find out, is my speedometer inaccurate? When I found out that girl's speedometer <laughs> was reading, you can also check the accuracy of the odometer that way. And a lot of these vehicles, now you can actually go in there with your scan tool if you got the right kind, and you can change the calibration on that speedometer. Well, on hers, I had to put a speedometer head in it. I don't know how she was driving that thing for a month, 85 miles an hour everywhere she went without getting a ticket. I don't know how she managed to pull that off. You know, it's just downright dangerous. You kill yourself driving that fast. Okay, uh, so anyway, number three is true. Federal and state laws prohibit changing the correct mileage on the odometer. What did I just say? That is true. The tachometer receives its signal from the positive side of the ignition coil. I was talking to our shop foreman one time, and our talk shop foreman was a cool guy. He looked, like, he looked and talked like Slim Pickens, you know, the old cowboy star. And I said... Um, and I was always wanting to fix these right. I would take them out. And he said, well, let's just look it up in the shop manual. And we looked it up in the shop manual, and the Ford shop manual says, we do not provide shop manual instructions for changing the odometer setting on uh, replacement speedometers, but it is a breach of federal law to put the vehicle out with less miles than it came in. And, um, so, and, I, and I told him, I said, so I'm changing this little drum. I'm going to make it right. When they leave, if they came in here with 58,247 miles, they're going to leave with 58,247 miles, and they're not going to have a red tenth digit if I can help it. And he goes, well, are we supposed to put them stickers on the doors? It tells us whenever you know, they send it with a speedometer, in case you you know don't know how to do this. And I says, well, what if, what, if, what if the customer peels the sticker off? And he says, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about these speedometers. So he wandered off out there somewhere, got all mad with me and everything. Well, the simple fact was, this is something that's a concern. We were having to fix a lot of speedometers. We replace them because they were making noise and stuff like that, you know. Technician A says, most electromagnetic gauges, if the sending unit resistance is low, the gauge will read low. Technician B says, in most bimetallic, most bimetallic gauges, that's the, the one I was telling you about that's got the bimetal strip in it, if the sending unit resistance is low, the gauge will read high. Yeah, that's a lot of words here, you know, number, that's C. And basically, that is if uh, if the sending unit resistance is low, meaning if it's closer to ground, you know, closer to being shorted, uh, it's going to reload. But I don't really see the thing about it is 
Even on electromagnetic gauges, not every sensor is going to do the same thing. I don't even like that question. You know, some of them read one way and some read the other. Technician A says needle movement in a three coil gauge, and that's the one I was talking about, is a result of the interaction of three electromagnets and the total field effect on the permanent magnet. Uh, technician B says the interaction of a permanent magnet and electromagnetic the total field effect causes the needle movement in the D'Arsenival gauge. And you're supposed to be reading your book to get the answers to that one there. That's number seven. That is both of those guys are right. The fuel gauge of a digital instrument cluster is missing two segments of its numer numerical display. Technician A says the cluster has excessive ground circuit resistance. Technician B says the cluster needs to be replaced. What do you think, y'all? If it's got two missing segments in its display. It's going to be B. It has to be. You're not going to be able to fix it. And I'll tell you something else, too. On a digital display, usually when you turn a key on and start it up, it's going to turn on all those segments. And then they'll, then it'll get, start reading normal. It turns on all the segments so you can tell if all the segments are good or not because each one of those things is a separate deal. Do you understand? You know these little, uh, see this little thing right here? Wait a minute. See these little uh, liquid crystal? Now, this is a dial indicator, and it's kind of useless because you can't measure any lateral run out or something with all the numbers changing. But you know how those work? That's polarized. Have you ever taken two pieces of polarized glass? Have you ever done that? And you take those two pieces of polarized glass and you put them like this so that they're lined up, you'll see a clear, just like a clear piece of glass. But if you turn them 90 degrees, all of a sudden it's black and you can't see nothing through them because it's only letting one wavelength through them. Polarized sunglasses, get an old pair of polarized sunglasses, break them in half. Hold the two lenses up like this, and you can turn them back and forth and change the amount of tint that you got. Pretty cool. That's how this works. It's got three layers of liquid crystal in there, and it's actually charging them this way and that to do that. You don't need to know that because you're not going to rebuild them, but you know that's just basically how it works. Uh, technician A says, depending on the manufacturer, a new IC chip may be programmed to display the last odometer reading. Uh, that's uh, And technician B says, some manufacturers provide the replacement uh, if the, for the IC chip if it fails. Uh, both of those guys are right, but some of these questions are sort of, of dated, you know, so be careful with that. Technician A says a tachometer is used to measure drive shaft speed. Are you reading drive shaft speed when you read a, tach a tachometer? Yes or no? No, you're not. What are you reading? Wow, it didn't take you long to fix that, did it? Okay, now drive this over to Andalusia and give it to Deborah. What are you smiling about? Can I fax it to her? No, fax won't work. She got an original. Uh -huh. uh, what does FAX stand for? Fax? Yeah. I don't know. Come on. Something. They originally something called zero. it facsimile. Oh, really? It's a facsimile. It's not the actual document. You remember about this blonde? And they said, we need you to fax this as a copy of your birth certificate. She goes, no, it's the only one I got. Well, you could, could you fax somebody a check? Well, no. Well, then you can't fax somebody an invoice. Okay. We're talking state auditors here, okay? Okay. All right. Let's flip this over. We've got about just a few minutes to do the rest of this. Technician A says, if all gauges are not operating, uh, check the fuse. Is that true? Technician B says, if only one gauge is affected, the instrument cluster ground is open. I sort of didn't read that right, but you get the point. A only. What question was that? Technician A says, if all gauges are not operating, check the fuse. Well, the fuse typically, most of the time, not in every case, but most of the time, the fuse feeds, you know, all of the gauges in the cluster. Technician B says, if only uh, only one gauge will be affected if the instrument cluster ground is open. And, you know, he's typically if the instrument cluster ground is open, you're going to have crazy stuff going on. So what was 10? Oh, we didn't tell you about 10? Oh, basically, uh, tachometer receives a signal from the, no, neither one of those guys are right. It doesn't come from the plus side of the ignition coil. It comes from the minus side, which is the trigger. Um, so technician A says, air core electromagnetic gauges and quartz swing needle displays are similar. Technician B says, quartz needle displays. Uh, the A coil is connected to the system voltage, and B coil receives a voltage proportional to input frequency. Who's correct about that? Anybody know? Let's go with C on that. Air core electromagnetic gauges and quartz swing needle displays. Have you guys seen the instrument cluster on that uh, Lexus out there? Is that a kind of a sexy thing? You ever seen it fire up? It's pretty cool. 
I mean that one that we're getting ready to retire. If you watch the instrument cluster, when it boots up, whoop, whoop, it looks like a, and some of them look like the needles are floating in space. They make gauges look pretty cool on some of them. They'll actually have a reflection of a, of a mirror image of the cluster, which is down here, and you'll be looking at a reflection of it, and it looks like the needles are floating in space. It looks like they're not even connected to anything. Pretty cool on some of the Lincolns and stuff. And the, the uh, Ford Fusion, when you boot that thing up, it looks like you're looking to start a video game or something. You know, puts out, you can change all this stuff on the side. Just need to all get out. Uh, let me see. Um, I've always been enamored with instrument clusters. I thought they were cool. Uh, let me see. Which one are we on? Uh, if the speedometer is not operating and the BCM or cluster module passes the self-test, this is technician A talking now, the fault may be in the vehicle speed sensor circuit. If the technician B says that if the speedometer works but the odometer does not, the speed sensor is likely the problem. That's A only. I just talked about that a few minutes ago. If one of those is working but the other one's not, you got problems with the cluster itself or with the instrument with the speedometer. Uh, and a lot of times you can't get just a speedometer anymore. You got to get the whole doggone thing. Um, let's see. Uh, technician A says a ground in the circuit between the indicator light and the pressure switch could cause the oil pressure light to stay on when the engine is running. He is correct. Technician B says an open in the pressure switch could cause the oil pressure light to stay on. Who is correct? Now, that depends on the vehicle. Starting in 1987, when Ford was using magnetic gauges on their vehicles, uh, they determined the little transducer that would actually drive the gauge to a sort of a semi, um, you know, accurate pressure reading. They didn't really, like the magnetic gauges didn't like those. So what they did was they had us put a contact switch in there so that when we had oil pressure, it would close that contact switch. And we were supposed to put a 22 ohm resistor in series with the wire that plugged into the sensor. And what that did, 22 ohms, put the gauge right in the middle. Now, whenever that gauge is shorted, it's gonna show oil pressure if the wire is shorted to ground. Now, they moved the 22 ohm resistor actually onto the, the uh, back up into the printed circuit and all that after that. So make sure that you know which kind you're talking about. A lot of cars nowadays, well, like for instance, you guys worked on the charger. I mean, that charger that had you put that oil pressure gauge. That oil pressure gauge had three wires and it was talking to the PCM. But there was a different one that talked to the to the sending unit. I don't know why they didn't multiplex that over there one way or another. Um, the vehicles, uh, let's see, yeah, number 14 is going to be an A. Uh, vehicles electronic digital fuel gauge is always reading a full tank. All the other instrument gauges are operating correctly. Which of the following is the most likely to be the cause of this problem? I'm going to say high resistance in the fuel gauge center circuit. Now, Dunny uh, showed me a peculiar situation the other day. He had this vehicle that came in that had run out of gas at three, at, when it was still reading a quarter of a tank. And he hadn't long put a sending unit in it. And whenever he got that thing on the bench, the empty was supposed to be reading something like, uh, on that particular one, it was, a, it was a screwy deal, but it was supposed to be reading 220 ohms empty and 15 ohms full. Now, it was the opposite on that one than it is on a lot of the gauges. On a lot of the gauges, when you short the wires, like the, you have low resistance, empty, and high resistance full, his, that particular one that he was working on was different from that. And he raised that thing up, that float up and down while measuring the resistance with his meter, and on the, whenever the thing was empty, it was only reading 165 ohms. And of course, it was reading normally at full. But that was causing it not to read empty, and it caused them to run out of gas. They had to get it brought, on, brought in on the hook. And I don't know how that failure occurred. You could see it fell and shorted, but not partially, you know what I'm saying, partial ohms. I mean, it didn't look like there was anything wrong with it. Just looking at it, it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Um, let me see. Um, number 15, I had said it was D. Technician A says a normally open switch is used in most coolant temperature warning light circuits. Technician B says most oil pressure warning circuits use a normally closed switch. And that's going to be Charlie oil pressure. And that is not true. Like the Fords I was talking about, they got an oil pressure sending unit switch. It closes when you get oil pressure. That drives the gauge to the middle. The ones that are operating a light are going to be closed when there's no oil pressure. So be aware of that. Find out how the thing works. If you're going to check the thing, check the sending unit, unplug a sending unit, hook your test light to ground, and just ease that test light into that sending unit wire and watch what the gauge does. That's the easiest way to do that. You hear me? Everybody listening, Brian? Whenever you take it, whenever you're measuring that, find out whether, you know, whether it's, you know, unplug it first and see what it does, right? Okay, say, okay, I unplugged it and it went 
whatever. You know, it went this way or that. Next, hook your test light to ground and touch the probe of your test light to the wire that you unplug from the sending unit and see what the gauge does then. If the gauge is unresponsive, no matter what you do, then you're going to start suspecting the gauge, really. See what I mean? Or if the gauge is reading wrong a lot of times. Um, and on these other ones, uh, these Ford ones out here, like this one right here, this one right here has got a, this right here is called a slosh module. That's what it is. It's kind of aggravating to get out of there. See that? Now why is the slosh module there? The slosh module is there so that whenever you're driving around corners and all, your gas gauge is not doing all of this. That's what that's about. We don't know who that is. Hello? Hey. Not that I know of. I know which I know what kind of a wrench you're talking about, but I've never I've never had one of those. And I don't think I always just have to cobble something. All right, all right. A little Eddie calling to see about a part here. Let me see here. Um, where are we at here? 16, Which of the following is not true about a quartz analog speedometer system? A. The signal from the permanent magnet generator is a DC frequency. B. The signal from the vehicle speed sensor is modified by the vehicle speed sensor buffer. C. This system uses an uh, analog to digital converter. Or D. The signal from the vehicle speed sensor is an AC voltage. Actually, the signal from the permanent magnet generator is not going to be a DC frequency. Never. Uh, it's basically going to be, uh, anal I mean, it's going to be AC. Uh, you remember one year you guys were doing the checking the uh, wheel speed sensors with the scope and all that? You're actually getting an uh, AC voltage on those. And you're also measuring it with your meter on the AC range. 17K? Uh, so basically, yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, what usually controls an oil pressure warning lamp? Voltage drop? Ground switch, ground sensor, any of the above? D. B, actually, the ground switch. And technician A says when testing a system using an IVR, use a voltmeter to test for regulated voltage at a common point. Technician B says if regulated voltage is within specifications, IVR is instrument voltage regulator. Uh, technician B says if regulated voltage is within specifications, you must replace the printed circuit board. That's wrong because you can replace the instrument voltage regulator if you've got one. That is a, that's, that's such antiquated stuff. Um, what I used to do when I was working on one of those, I'd get my test light and hook it to ground and I would touch it to the sensor wire and you ought to see it pulsing usually if it's got an instrument voltage regulator, but those are the ones that had bimetal gauges and anyway. So 19 there? Yeah. And yeah, 19 is, uh, yeah. What was five? Hmm. Five? Yeah. Uh, false. You yeah, don't get it from the positive side of the coil. All right.